We have a few minutes left for uh, questions and answers. So if you have a question uh, for Bob about Titanic or any of the things that he's oh, talked about today, there we go. Oh, I see a question today, of very go. importance right over here. <laughs> Hello there, young lady. Yes. The, uh, there are uh, deep water barnacles, but the main thing that's on the Titanic is bacteria that's actually eating the Titanic. And they form these, when we first saw them, I created a word because we'd never seen them before. And I was just notified by Oxford Dictionary that my word has now been accepted mm -hmm. in the English language. <laughs> it's called a rust sickle because it looked like an ice sickle because it was draping down but it was, it was reddish and orange. And so I said it looked like a rusty icicle, so I call mm -hmm. it a rust sickle. And it turns out, out that's the cocoon in which the bacteria is living. Because the bacterium doesn't like seawater. It likes its own little world that's more acidic. So it built a cocoon, and it's living in that cocoon. And most of it, if you flip it, it almost goes up in dust. There's not much, fortunately, not a lot of the Titanic in a rust sickle. It looks like lots of it, but it's really very little. But there are barnacles down there, too. And uh, are you going to become an ocean explorer? Oh, good. And what's yes. your name? Olivia. And how old are you? Five. You are. <laughs> right. That was not a set-up question. <laughs> but that's so cool. Because I actually recruit some of my team members I recruited when they were 12 in the Art Jason project, and now PhDs. I'm that's old. Um, Dr. Ballard, we have the sad missing Malaysian aircraft at the moment. Have you been asked or for any assistance at this time? Oh, yes. So, but, you know, that's tragic because uh, the, the, we don't know where it is. And uh, you can't mount a hunt because I've hunted in, you know, as I showed you in that image of what's down there, everything's down there, mountain ranges, the deepest canyons, every kind of real estate you can imagine. So finding something is always your strategy and the tools you pull out of your, the arrows you pull out of your quiver are defined about what you're up against. What are we up against? How deep is it? What kind of terrain is it? What's our degree of uncertainty? Is there debris? So I have responses once I can get some answers, but every three minutes it's changed oceans on me. So n until it finally, that we just, uh, what, early this morning, Australia said they saw satellite images uh, off, off Perth. Oh my God, we're now off Perth, for God's sakes. I mean, it's amazing where this plane has been going all over on the map. And that is just, you know, a third of the Earth. And so I thought Amelia Earhart was, was tough, which has never been found, uh, until they get some definitive evidence, and unfortunately the, the black box is gonna run out of energy it only runs for 30 days and then it goes off. And once you lose that, then you really are hurting. I would think that if they, if they went out to that debris uh, today and, it, and they couldn't find it and then the sun went down. So right now off Perth, it's, the sun's about to come up. So uh, if you can find definitive debris, you can then back calculate on currents and try to get it down to where at least you can run around and try to hear it. So if, if, if we're fortunate, which we haven't been yet, and there is definitive debris from that ship, and you, we, we know the currents and circulation, so you can back calculate and at least get you to some reasonable box where you can try to listen. How far can you listen with going out to the ping of the recorder? Uh, it depends upon the system. I haven't actually heard numbers. I know in the French airlines, it's about uh, uh, 10 to 15 kilometers. Sure. But you have helicopters that can dunk them. You have dunkers. And we certainly have, have deployed some of our most advanced assets into the Indian Ocean. And we have helicopters that can go pretty fast and hover and dunk uh, listening devices to hear and then run quickly and, and try to, you would, you would basically go to the range of the system, range of the system, and have them lay down a pattern until you tried to hear it. Uh, then the, the tool of choice now, like the tool of choice on the French airplane are the new autonomous vehicles, the AUVs. And you can send swarms of them out, like hornets or wolf pack. Uh, but they're about two, three million dollars a clip. And, uh, but you, we have those kinds of assets. They're like underwater drones, like cruise missiles. They don't go, they go reasonably fast, but in the ocean don't go fast at all. 
and you can lay in a grid pattern trying to pick up the debris. I mean, it, it, but you got to narrow it. Which ocean are we in? You know. Yes. Hello. I, thanks very much for the talk. Rob was very uh, informative. Beg your pardon. Thank you very much for the talk. It was well, very thank you for informative. coming. I would just uh, like to say I've always been captivated by the Titanic for a, a very long time, and. Um, Recently, well, not m this over this last couple of months, there has been well a lot of conspiracy theories going about on the internet and whatnot about the switching theory. I would just like to know what is your take on it the switching theory? And sank. Yeah, but <laughs> I I do believe it is the Titanic at the bottom of the sea. I want to believe that, but there's oh that it's the it's the Olympic. I would just say as a man who's actually been close to the Titanic on the on the actual. Well, you know, bed. I've heard everything you can yeah. imagine. But what could, you, what could you say to actually I think it's the Titanic the on the bottom of the ocean. Oh, I, I do believe so. And it struck an iceberg. It overdrove its headlights. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's a bu beautiful ship. I, I don't, uh, it was no different than the Olympic. And the Olympic did it 500 times. It just didn't run into an iceberg. Yeah. And so uh, I actually put the blame at the captain. He had ample warning to slow down his ship, and he chose not to. We've sort of made him a hero because he went down with the ship, but it's the captain who ignored, ignored those warnings. I mean, ships, he had reports of ice, no, not only north of him, but south of him. And if it was only north of him, you could sort of maybe excuse his bravado. But remember, the, 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 he was not used to, he brought out of retirement, he wasn't used to having a Marconi operator aboard when he was the captain. And the Marconi operator aboard was for the, passengers to send messages wasn't a part of the crew of the ship it was a service for the passengers so they had not developed a culture of even paying much attention to such messages he put them in his pocket so uh, if you're gonna be any blame it's the captain and he was he was he was he was good enough to go down with the ship the owner didn't but he by the way th there's a, there's a little misconception too on poor Bruce Ismay who was quite vilified uh, by the sinking because he, he survived. And, and most people don't know that when the captain issued his orders, the, the officers of the deck interpreted them differently on the port side than the starboard side. The port side uh, 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 thought the orders were women and children only. And they loaded the women and children, they lowered the boats commonly with not a lot of people in them. On the starboard side, the, the officers of the deck interpreted them differently, women and children first. And so they'd load up the boat, and if there were still empty seats, they put men in them. And that's where Ismay was on the starboard side, not the port side. And he got in a boat that was empty and about to go away. Uh, he couldn't quite honestly do anything. I was just in, uh, uh, I can't quite pronounce where I was, uh, uh, Bali in, in, in Bali in a hinge. <laughs> Sorry, you know, uh, castle, and that's where he died. He 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 went and hid there, and uh, he died in 1937. And uh, he really paid for it for the rest of his life. Yes, another. Yes. Um, how long do you predict that the Titanic will survive at the bottom of the ocean? What well, a lot of it. Well, if we've just stopped landing on it, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not terribly worried about those uh, bacterium. Uh, now this is going to sound crazy, and I want you to know I'm not crazy. I'm a risk taker, but I'm not crazy. You can clean and paint the Titanic. Now let that settle in. Okay, the, the main thing holding the Titanic together is its hull. And by the way, the hull in the bow went deep into the bottom almost 27 meters into the bottom. And, and as soon as that brand new ship went into that mud, it went uh, uh, anoxic. So if you dig down this far, it's brand new metal because the mud is anoxic. There's no oxygen to rust the ship. So it's being held, the bow anyway, is being held by the fact that a huge part of the bow is, is buried in the mud and it's being held in there. And mud is very sticky, by the way. But the thing that most amazed me when I first saw the Titanic, my, the first image I saw was the base of the Titanic, the anti rope bilge keels right here. And I was about this far away when we first saw it. And it was pink. Why was it pink? I was below the waterline and they painted it with anti-fouling paint. 
and the anti-fouling paint was still working. There was no rusticles. It was painted hull right there. As you go up and you wet above, above the water line, it was rusted because they never thought, well, the Titanic's going to sink, so let's put anti-fouling paint on everything. Now, we now have super tankers that are so large, you can't dry dock them after they're built, and they now can actually clean and paint them underwater with epoxy paints. They have a little robot, like a swimming tool. I don't know if you've seen the one that you dump in a swimming pool and runs around clean swimming. These things suction, they go on a suction, and they run around the hull and clean it real rapidly, and then they can actually paint it. So if you maintain the hull, don't we do conservation, preservation? It's not that terribly complicated to do. You can do it with robots pretty easily. Take you maybe a couple weeks. Go down and clean the hull and paint it. And preserve it, just like you try to you know, keep things going. Deep in the ship, it's very preserved. If you saw the footage down into the Turkish bath, my gosh, it was eerily uh, refreshed. So I think it'll be, as long as the damage that's being done now is more by the visitors who are landing on the Titanic and crushing it. I mean, I think you should visit the Titanic, but do it with ROVs. I mean, those submersibles are like big, you know, elephants in a china closet. They're cr they bump so easy in those big monstrous guys that, to, you know, they have so much inertia, they can easily just crush. Whereas the ROV, you can get within an inch and read. I, I went down there, and I could get within t a couple inches and read the detailed inscriptions on the machinery and never touch it. So I think if we can do, we can do two things, either stop loving it to death and then actually go in and do conservation, preservation. And you could introduce uh, certain materials in the interior of the ship which would further uh, preserve the interior. So I think it's going to be there a long, long, long time, personally. People want to, the salvagers have a, you know, <coughs> have, a, have a dog in the fight. They have a vested interest. I don't listen to them at all. You know, they just want to make money. Yeah. But you don't, in our country, you don't go to Gettysburg with a shovel. And you don't take belt buckles off the Arizona and Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Yes? I loved it. <laughs> I really loved it. It was a cool movie. Uh, uh, my, my wife was pregnant with Emily, actually, <laughs> when the movie came out. And, and, and Jim Cameron, who's a very good friend, called me. And he said, Bob, I want you to come to the premiere. And I said, well, when is it? And he said, well, we're going to do it in Hollywood in November. What's your birthday, Emily? 26th. November 26th. And I said, uh-oh, <laughs> Emily's due to come into the world. I got to be at the 50-yard line to take the catch, <laughs> and, uh, which I did. Uh, so I said, I, I, I can't, I can't. You know, I got, a, I got a baby coming into the world. And he said, well, that's too bad, and he hung up. Then he but. You know, about Jim, he processed this thing real fast. Come about an hour. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I got another idea. After we do the premiere in Hollywood, we're going to do a fundraiser for kids. He has a handicapped sister, and I have a handicapped sister, uh, in D.C. And we're going to do a fundraiser. And can you, it's in December. And I said, yeah, I can make that. Emily will be in the world by then. And so he, he said, great. So he gave me the dates and all of that. And then... He told his publicists, you know, they were going to do this thing together. And they, they let the word out, and they told Larry King, who's a big night guy, used to be anyway. And they told Larry King, and Larry King's people called. He says, we understand you're going to come. And they said, can we have you on Larry King Live? And I said, yeah, I don't see any problem. And so uh, then they got back to Cameron's people, and then the camera people said, wait a minute, you can't go on Larry King Live and talk about the Titanic movie if he hasn't seen it. So he says, he calls me up, he says, oh my God, I, I'm sorry, we got to get a film crew out with a movie. So what's your local cinema? Well, we're living, you know, in the woods in Connecticut, and I said, well, there's one in, in a place called Old Saybrook, and they said, well, fine, we'll fly the movie out tomorrow, and you go see it in the movie. <laughs> and then he realized they didn't have Dolby sound or something. <laughs> <laughs> so then, oh no, we can't do it. So then he finally said, well, we'll do it in some near Hartford. So it was really funny, because uh, the, they sent a lovely limo, picked up my wife, Barbara, and Emily's inside, I still at that moment. Uh, and uh, we went up, and it was the only, oh, no, Emily had been born. That's right, Emily had been born. She was just days old. 
I think it's the only child that was nursed through a movie of the Titanic, because we were the only two people in theaters. <laughs> it was huge theater, there was two people there. It was really fun, so anyway. I think, one more? Yes. I, c I know. I, I, I'll work on it. <laughs> oh, a very simple question, two parts, very simple. The first one, do you like Clyde Tucker books? No. <laughs> that was the answer I was expecting and hoping for. The second one. Well, well the reason, let me ask, he defies <laughs> physics, you know, and I just have this problem yeah. of defying physics, so I'm stuck with that problem. Well, you don't do some serious, what well, you thought could be made out to be serious work. I just wonder whether you do any work at all with Clyde. No, I know him, and I've met him. Uh, Clyde works uh, in, in very, very shallow water. We, we work in very deep water. And it's sort of like taking the space shuttle from here to Belfast or something, you know, it's just to, from Belfast to Dublin. It's just, you don't take the space shuttle. And we have, the technology we have is so awesome, as they would say in Boston, wicked awesome. Another word I won't add. Uh, so no, I, I don't. I, I work in very, very deep, deep world. But yeah, I just had, and I don't think Dirk Pitt's the greatest role model for, <laughs> for young boys and young girls. I don't believe in, the, in that kind of s stupid bravado, you know, it's <laughs> dumb. So, I, mean, I, guess, I, I guess that won't make it onto the cover of the next book <laughs> as, as a ringing endorsement. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for coming Thank tonight. You. But also, can I ask you to show your appreciation for Dr. Robert Barrett? <laughs>